You're at the Explore Scientific Customer Service and Training Center, and we're going to learn how to choose and use eyepieces. Modern design of telescope eyepieces have revolutionized visual astronomy with breakthroughs in computer optimization and new optical glasses. Today's top eyepiece manufacturers design high-performance eyepieces with superior edge performance with a wide range of apparent fields and long eye relief. So how do you choose? Today there are many premium quality eyepieces to choose from for your telescopes. But with so many focal lengths and a variety of apparent fields of view, how do you choose what's best and what fits you best for your specific telescope? Here are the eyepiece selection considerations. We're going to find out the lowest useful magnification of your telescope, the highest useful magnification, how to choose eyepieces between lowest and highest useful magnification that will give you the medium steps and power with your telescope, selecting a set of eyepieces that have the apparent fields of view that you desire that will produce the true fields of view that you typically require for the objects that you observe. And then you need to consider a set of eyepieces that have enough eye relief so that you can have the eye comfort that you require. This is how a telescope works. Aperture, focal length, f-ratio. The telescope focal length divided by the telescope aperture equals F ratio. From here we can determine magnification and true fields of view. So let's discuss focal length. All telescopes and eyepieces have optics polished to focus at a certain distance. This distance between the lens and the focused image, usually measured in millimeters, is called focal length. A longer focal length lens produces a narrower field of view and a shorter focal length lens produces a wider field of view. So how does magnification work? The focused image from the telescope lens is being magnified by the eyepiece. In this case, the telescope focal length is about 160 millimeters, and the eyepiece is only 20 millimeters, producing eight times magnification. This is how we calculate magnification. What you do is you take the telescope focal length, usually in millimeters, divided by the eyepiece focal length, also in millimeters, and that will equal magnification or you can take the telescope aperture in millimeters and divide it by the exit pupil in millimeters and that will also equal the magnification. Now we'll discuss exit pupil. Every telescope and eyepiece combination will produce an exit pupil. It's the focus beam of light where the image is viewed. The diameter of the exit pupil changes with magnification. Lower magnifications produce a larger exit pupil giving a brighter image. Higher magnifications produce a smaller exit pupil with less image brightness. This is the formula for calculating exit pupil. You take the eyepiece focal length in millimeters and you divide it by the telescope F ratio. And that will give you the exit pupil number. Or you can take the telescope aperture in millimeters and divide it by magnification. And this will also give you the exit pupil number. Both of these numbers will end up being in millimeters. Observing faint objects. Telescopes are light gathering devices capable of focusing images of objects at incredible distances. Under dark skies and the right telescope and eyepiece combination, it's possible to visually observe faint galaxies that are many millions of light years away. Of course, with more light to your eye, you can see the faintest details of every object you look at. But to see the faintest details, you need to be comfortable and observe at the lowest useful magnification. In order to see the faintest and the most distant celestial objects possible through your telescope, you need to find the eyepiece focal length that will produce an exit pupil that will closely match the entrance pupil of your fully dilated eye when dark adapted. For young people, it's not unusual for pupils to dilate to 7 millimeters or more. Older people may have pupils that can only dilate to 5 millimeters. So visit your eye doctor to have your fully dilated pupils accurately measured. With this information, you can choose the perfect lowest power eyepiece. Now for determining lowest useful magnification power, Try to determine which eyepiece on your telescope will produce an exit pupil that comes closest to matching your fully dilated eye. If you select an eyepiece that produces a larger exit pupil than what your eye can dilate to, then you're not able to experience the full brightness of the focused image. 
it's important to calculate the eyepiece focal length for lowest useful magnification. Here's a useful formula for calculating the eyepiece focal length for lowest useful magnification. What you do is you take the telescope aperture in millimeters and you divide it by the fully dilated eye in millimeters. That will give you lowest useful magnification. Then take the telescope focal length in millimeters and divide it by the lowest useful magnification number. That will tell you which eyepiece focal length you need. Another typical way to find lowest useful magnification is to use the rule of thumb of three and a half power per inch of aperture. With a 102 millimeter lens, a four inch aperture telescope, the lowest useful magnification is 14 times. But what about high power observing? Telescopes are also detail resolving devices capable of focusing highly detailed images of objects. Under steady skies called good or perfect seeing conditions, and the right telescope and eyepiece, it's possible to visually observe incredibly fine features of bright objects like the planets and the moon. But there's a limit to how much magnification you can use, and that limitation will be based on the atmospheric scene conditions and the telescope's aperture. Having several eyepiece focal lengths from lowest useful magnification to highest useful magnification will maximize your observing potential. Atmospheric seeing and the Pickering scale. The atmosphere can be very turbulent, called bad seeing, to perfectly calm, called perfect seeing. Turbulence in the air causes stars to scintillate or twinkle. Viewing conditions with bad seeing, one to four on the Pickering scale, distort images of stars, planets, and even the moon. This distortion looks much worse with larger aperture and higher magnification. Viewing conditions with good to perfect seeing, which would be seven to 10 on the Pickering scale, allows telescopes to be used at higher magnifications which will reveal fine details on every object you observe. The Pickering scale shows one is the worst seeing with five arc seconds or more star blur at the sharpest focus, and 10 is perfect with 0.5 arc seconds or less. Average nights of seeing would range from five to seven on the Pickering scale. To determine highest useful magnification on any given telescope, determine the telescope's aperture in millimeters and multiply that number by three. With this 102 millimeter refractor, the result is 306 power. So how do you calculate the eyepiece focal length for highest useful magnification? So this formula is for calculating the eyepiece focal length for the highest useful magnification. What you do is you take the telescope aperture in millimeters, multiply by three, and that'll give you the highest useful magnification number. Or a more conservative number could be brought about by taking the telescope aperture in inches, multiplying it by 60, or if your scene conditions are not that great, maybe by 50, and that would give you the new highest useful magnification number. Then you take the telescope focal length in millimeters and you divide it by the highest useful magnification number. That will give you the eyepiece focal length that you need to get. What's aperture masking and how can it improve your high power observing? During times of poor to bad seeing, images of the moon, planets, and double stars observed at higher power can be improved by reducing the entrance aperture of your telescope. Masks can be made from various sizes from cardboard. With less aperture, there is less resolving power, but images will look sharper. Now that you understand lowest useful magnification and highest useful magnification, you need to calculate the medium steps and power so that you can get the best observing potential possible. Many astronomers own several eyepieces that range from lowest to highest power for their telescope. Medium power eyepieces are also selected by magnification, apparent field of view, and eye relief. Many astronomers begin their observations at low or lowest power and then gradually increase power until the object is best seen. What are eyepiece multipliers? Increasing magnification of your lower power eyepieces can also be done by adding focal extenders or a Barlow lens to your eyepieces. The advantage is that these devices can increase the magnification of all your eyepieces, but the eye relief will remain unaffected. This is especially useful if you need long eye relief of your long focal length eyepiece, but you want more magnification. Many people want to know what's the difference between apparent field of view and true field of view. True field of view is the actual degrees of sky coverage that you're looking at, the chunk of sky that you see. But apparent field of view is the angle of degrees from your eye to the edge of the field stop in the eyepiece. When you're looking through an eyepiece that has wider apparent field of view, you not only get more true field of view, but you get this effect that you're seeing through a wide picture window. 
More apparent field of view gives you more true field of view. The Orion Nebula M42 is 60 arc minutes by 66 arc minutes in angular size, or twice the size of the full moon in the sky. This is M42 with a telescope of 714 millimeters of focal length and a 68 degree 20 millimeter eyepiece. This gives you 35.7 power and it will also produce a 1.9 degree true field of view. Then in this other image, we've got M42 with a telescope of the same focal length, 714 millimeters, and the same focal length of eyepiece of 20 millimeters. So we're getting the same magnification of 35.7 power. But with 100 degree apparent field of view, we're getting 2.8 degrees true field of view. You actually see more area around the object, but at the same magnification. So how do you calculate true field of view? You take the eyepiece apparent field of view and you divide it by magnification and that will equal true field of view in degrees. Or another way of doing this is take the eyepiece field stop. You can get that from the manufacturer. You divide it by the telescope focal length in millimeters and you multiply it by 57.3 and that will also give you the true field of view number in degrees. You have to relax to see more, and this is the importance of eye relief. Eye relief is the distance from the last surface of an eyepiece of which the observer's eye can see the full viewing angle. If the observer's eye is outside of this distance, then the observer will not see the full viewing angle. Long eye relief eyepieces give more eye comfort, and if long enough, 18 millimeters or more, will allow observers to wear glasses when observing. That's usually needed for someone that has astigmatism in their eyes. Generally speaking, short focal length, higher power eyepieces have less eye relief than long focal length, lower power eyepieces. Eye relief distance information is provided by the manufacturer. You love to observe deep sky objects, but what about light pollution? Just because you're not under the best dark sky sight doesn't mean that you can't still observe some bright galaxies, star clusters, and nebula. Improving your skills as an astronomer has a lot to do with how often you observe, even if that means you do most of your observing near city lights. To improve the view of deep sky objects under light polluted skies, you can use moderate increases in magnification, which will make the background sky look darker. There are also special filters that you can use with your eyepieces that can increase contrast. To judge the quality of your sight, you can use the Bortle scale. You can have the darkest skies possible but also not see very many stars, and that has to do with atmospheric transparency. The Bortle scale is a nine-level numeric scale that measures the night sky's brightness of a particular location. It quantifies the astronomical observability of celestial objects and the interference caused by light pollution. Class 9 on the Bortle scale is the most light polluted sky, where you can barely see any stars in the sky at all. When you go all the way down to class 1, you're now under perfectly dark sky conditions where the sky's black to the horizon. But there's another aspect that's very important to astronomers and that is sky transparency and atmospheric extinction. It's possible to be under a dark sky but not to be able to see many stars due to poor sky transparency or atmospheric extinction. Generally speaking, the very best dark sky sites are far away from city lights. You're up high in elevation with smooth terrain and the sky has very little water vapor or aerosols in the atmosphere. You can learn more about sky transparency and atmospheric extinction at this website. So to sum it up, by choosing the right eyepieces, you're going to have the most relaxing, most detailed observations you can possibly make. The more comfortable you are and the longer you look, the more you see. Long eye relief eyepieces with large apparent field characteristics allow you to relax more at the eyepiece by letting you back away from the optics while allowing your eye to comfortably scan the field of view in order to use averted vision. A relaxed eye observing at any magnification that's not staring at the object can see fainter details and finer structure than a strained eye. So happy observing. Hey everybody, it's Mike Hatch with Explore Scientific and thank you for joining us in how to clean our waterproof eyepieces. So as you're out there viewing the night sky, you're going to have 
uh, a multiple variety of eyepieces, different brands uh, from different manufacturers, different eye reliefs, uh, different uh, field of views. Well, the great thing about these Explore Scientific waterproof eyepieces is that they are sealed with our Argon Purged. Um, they have a lifetime warranty, fully transferable, and uh, they are easy to clean and maintain. So today I'm going to use one of our 62 degree 40s and we're literally going to dunk it into this water with some of our household items here and we're going to clean these eyepieces. Now again, I want to say, uh, if you have a non-waterproof eyepiece, uh, you do not want to try this. Basically what will happen is water will get into those uh, eyepieces, get onto those optics and you'll have to then take it apart or send it in for repair. So again, waterproof eyepieces only. So we're going to take just some degreaser here and I'm just going to pour a couple drops into the water that we've got. Now I'm going to take the eyepiece, I'm going to remove the eye relief uh, just to clean it separately, but uh, now I'm just going to take this eyepiece and kind of swoosh it around in the water. All right. Now that I've dunked it in a few times, I'm going to wipe off just that excess water on the outside. I'm then going to take some distilled water. I'm going to go ahead and spray it directly onto those optics. And with that distilled water, what that does is it helps uh, keep it to where there's no water spots drying onto those optics. So then we're going to take our pressured air, canned air. We're going to blow it off and then wipe it down. And I'm using a microfiber cloth here to wipe down the eyepiece, just the outside. You can take some tissue paper or something nice and soft uh, for those optics. And that is it. That is our process on how to clean uh, Explore Scientific waterproof eyepieces. Literally something you can do in minutes um, with some household objects. So, uh, you know, give us a call or shoot us an email if you have any questions. Um, and keep looking up.